Would you pray with me, please? Father God, we thank you. We thank you so much that we have this opportunity to come before you and hear hear your voice through our voices. Hear your word through our words. My Father, speak to our hearts. Let the reading of your word and the preaching of your word convict us and correct us and encourage us and grow us and mature us and affirm us. My Father, speak. Speak through me today. Speak through all of us to one another. My Father, we are grateful to you for your word. It is a life-giving word. We receive it. In the name of Jesus, Father. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be together with you, and i like to invite you to... Uh, I'm not going to have you open your Bibles today because I'm not going to be really addressing uh, the Scriptures, uh, not directly, uh, but I do invite you to pull in your bulletins uh, the sheet of paper where you can take notes because I do have a lot of information and teaching uh, to offer you this morning. So you may want to, uh, to have that ready and have a pen and pencil as well so you can take notes. And, and then if, if you go to the website during the week or the following week and re-listen to the sermon, you can correspond it with your notes and, and remember some of what I have taught to you this morning. Uh, as you know, uh, those of you who have been coming the last couple of weeks, I have been teaching you from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Uh, the first uh, week, I think a couple of weeks ago, I taught you from chapter 2, I believe. And last week, I spent some time with you talking about chapter 4. If you remember, we were talking and I said to you uh, to pay attention to the word therefore. At the very beginning, I therefore, the prisoner uh, of Jesus Christ. And, and then he calls us to walk in the walk that is respecting to or corresponding to the teachings that have been given before. And one of the things, and, and there was a list of, of things that we need to walk on or, or walk with, and among them was, uh, was gentleness and, and faith and, um, uh, and perseverance and, and long-suffering. And there was a list of, of things bearing with one another. Remember, we spent time talking about what it means to bear with one another and, and so on. And I said to you that one of the things that is important, that is part of our walk, uh, our very, one of the things that is very important in our walk is our unity. Uh, unity is a sign uh, that we are walking in accordance with what the Lord has revealed to us. And, and in talking about unity, I shared with you uh, chapter 4, verse 4, uh, which uh, I think it will be in the, in the screen. Um, but one of the things I talked to you was at unity in, on Ephesus chapter 4, verse 4. And, and the thing I, I mentioned to you about that passage is that this is a creedal statement of St. Paul. And that's very important. This is a creedal statement. This is a I believe type of statement. And St. Paul says this, that there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all, and in you all, okay? Unity was part of the message of Paul for our walk in Christ. 
And, and the, 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 the word that keeps being repeated in this creedal statement is the word one. Okay? One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Uh, in other words, uh, these people on this side of the church doesn't have a different faith as these people in the church. These people in the front that don't have a different Lord than the ones in the back. The people here in this church don't have a different God than all other believers. We, our unity, our unity is in that we share together one faith, one church, undivided and universal church. So in the creed, when we say we believe in one church, holy, Catholic, and apostolic, we believe in one church that is universal. We have unity with all believers everywhere as long as the foundation of our faith is Jesus Christ. For no other building can be built than one that has the foundation in Jesus Christ. He is the foundation of the temple of God in which the Holy Spirit lives. That's for those of us who have been reading through 1 Corinthians. That's, that's just what we read uh, this, this past week. So we all have one faith. And um, one of the things I want to say to you is that the Christian church, the Christian church has always been a creedal church. I want you to notice that. The Christian church has always been a creedal church. A creedal church expressing in words what we believe. And that's not only the Christian church. All through the Old Testament, the Jewish people have always stood in a creedal statement of faith. There's a number of creedal statements even through the Old Testament. We as Christians, we stand on the shoulders of the faith of the Jewish people, of the Hebrew people. And so what we can say is that all through the Bible, we have a number of creedal statements. And this is one of those creedal statements that we find in the letters of Paul. One faith. We believe that we are one faith, one baptism, one Lord, one spirit, one hope. I found uh, some quotes that I want to be able to read to you. These are extremely important statements that I find so powerful. The confession of faith is an essential moment in the life of a Christian. Okay, pay attention to that. That moment when we say we believe in God, we believe in Jesus Christ, says the confession of faith is an essential moment in the life of a Christian. In confession, the believer speaks out before men and with men. The silent thought and affirmation of his heart and mind. He makes outward what is inward. In confession, the believer takes his stand. Pay attention to this. In confession, the believer takes his stand, commits his life, declares what he believes to be true, affirms his ultimate loyalty, and defies every false claim upon his life. The confession of faith is the seal of faith and the courage of faith. Just stay there for a moment. Take a look at that. We, the believer, takes a stand, commits his life, declares what he believes to be true. In our creedal statement, we affirm who we're loyal to, 
and we reject and deny any other claims than what we believe. When we stand and say we believe in God, there is nothing that can compete with that statement. There is nothing that can confuse that statement. It is the statement of faith that we believe in the God of Scripture. We believe in the God who has revealed himself. We believe that that God gave his son for our salvation. We believe that that God gave his spirit that lives in us. We believe, and in that we stand, and in that we're firm, and all other beliefs have to flee, because that's the one belief of the church. That's the one belief of the believer. Next quote that I found extremely fascinating. Christians who first said credo, where that's where we get the word creed from, and credo means I believe in Greek. I believe. Christians who first said credo, I believe did not do so lightly, but at a risk of their lives under severe persecution. To say credo, I believe, genuinely, is to speak of oneself from the heart, to reveal who one is by confessing one's essential belief, the faith that makes life worth living. One who says credo without the willingness to suffer and if necessary die for the faith has not genuinely said credo. Take a look at that portion. One who says I believe and is not willing to die for that belief has not meant I believe. I believe requires that you move according to that belief, that you live according to that belief, that you behave according to that belief, that you defend that belief absent of every other belief. I believe was the statement of a, an early Christian church that was willing to suffer, sacrifice, lose everything, but they would not lose Jesus. Once they had come to faith, all other things did not matter, but that they pleased their Lord and their Savior. Today in the world, there are people who rather die then go back on that statement of faith. I believe. I submit myself to the lordship of my God. In the West, in the West, I'm not sure that we even understand too much the implications of that word. We say we believe, but we don't always behave as if we truly believed. We believe, but anything else that gets on the way, sometimes that gets the attention. We are not willing to even sacrifice time, effort, and other treasures for the sake of what we believe or who we believe in. Take a look at that statement. He who says, credo, I believe, without the willingness to suffer, and if necessary, die for the faith, has not really, truly, reasonably understood and meant, I truly, really, definitely, unchangingly believe. I believe is an essential statement of a person who has come to know Almighty God and what His Son has done and that He has moved into our lives 
and we've received grace upon grace. As I said below, be, before, the word credo is from the Greek and it means I believe. In the Anglican communion, in the Anglican church, in all of the Anglican church, and not just us, but in particular our Anglican church, we have actually three creeds that we hold on to. Three creeds that are essential to us. One is the so-called the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed is using much of our liturgies, primarily morning and evening prayers, and perhaps noon prayers, and, and in other forms of the liturgy. The Apostles' Creed is a creed possibly that began to be said in the second century, perhaps even toward the first of the first century. It is believed that it is the creed, the statement of faith of someone who had come to faith and was about to be baptized. It was thought to be a baptismal statement of faith. It is called the Apostles' Creed, not because the apostles created it or wrote it, but because it is a statement of faith that is found in Scripture. All of the statements of the Apostles' Creed come from the teachings of Scripture. And they follow the general pattern of all creeds, which is the Trinity. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Holy Spirit. So the Apostles' Creed are just, is, a, is the shorter version of what we use on Sundays uh, in the Nicene Creed. But the Apostles' Creed uh, is, is very much biblical statements of the faith that we hold. The second creed that, that is prominent in the Anglican Church uh, is the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed was born really out of a lot of contentions even within the church, not just outside the church, as to what does it mean to believe in Jesus Christ and who is Jesus Christ. And so in around the year 325, uh, there was a, a, the, the, one of the first major councils of the church to try and define exactly what we believed. And the Nicene Creed was born probably in Nicaea. It was developed farther in the, in the Council of Constantinople. And it was probably uh, finished in, in the way that we have it in the Council of Toledo in Spain much later on. And I will give you more information on this as we proceed uh, looking at the creed. But the Nicene Creed elaborates a little bit more what it is that we believe. And then the third creed that most of you probably have never read, uh, but it is in most of our Book of Common Prayers, is what's called the Athanasian Creed. The Athanasian Creed is much longer than any of the other creeds. It is very... Um, it, it probably comes from Athanasius himself, the defender of the faith at Nicaea. Um, and the Athanasian Creed is very much worth reading because it's even more detailed than the Nicene Creed, much longer, but much more difficult, and you have to stop and reason through it, what's Athanasius saying, and it's probably not one that we want to recite every Sunday. Uh, a church during communion. Plus, it, it is a very difficult uh, creed for us to memorize. Believe me, it, it is in most of our 1979 prayer books and most likely will be in the Agna uh, liturgies that are coming out next year. But the likelihood is, is you're going to read it, you're going to be blessed by the Athanasian Creed, but it's not going to be a creed you're going to memorize that easy because of its length and its complexity. But those are the three creeds that we hold on to, that we as the church believe. Now, during the month of August, I have decided that the, the, the following four Sundays of August, I'm going to take you through the Nicene Creed. 
I'm going to take you through each line and each things that we claim we believe because if we use the Nicene Creed so often, in fact, every Sunday and every time there is a communion service, we ought to know exactly what it is we claim we believe. And I'm going to deal today just with the first part of the Nicene Creed. It says, we believe in one God. The Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. That's the first part of the creed, and it deals with who God the Father is. Okay? First of all, I would want you to stop at the words, we believe. We believe. In some creeds and in some other denominations, and probably even in our own denomination early on, you may have re recognized or remember the creed as beginning, I believe. I believe. And there's nothing wrong with, with you praying and me praying the creed and saying, I believe. Because it is a wonderful statement of personal faith, individual and personal faith. But when we use it here in the church, we say we believe. We believe as a corporate group of believers. Because yes, we all have an individual and personal faith, but it is important that our unity is there. That the unity is proclaimed. We all together, we believers in the Lord God Almighty, we believe, and here we stand, we believe in God. So, first of all, I want you to notice that, and there's nothing wrong with I believe. But we believe is equally very important to understand. And when we recite it, we are saying together, we are in unity in our faith. Secondly, we believe in one God. That's so important. We believe in one God. As Christians, we cannot deny the revelation of God in all of the Bible, including the Old Testament. We cannot and will not, and it's not orthodox, to ignore the revelation of God in the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament, it is the word of God, and it is the word about God. And so we stand on the Old Testament as we are New Testament people. And one of the key declarations... One of the key declarations of the faith of the Jewish community, which they repeat daily more than once, it's, it's probably their most important creedal statement, is what's called the Shema. The Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. 6 4. Hear, O Israel. The Lord your God, the Lord is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Now, those of you that were with me last Sunday night at the conversation between a Christian, a, a Jew, and a Muslim, you will remember that one of the questions I was asked by my a friend and, and, and uh, you know, um, yeah, my friend, he's not a pastor, but he's my friend, uh, the, 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 um, the Muslim. One of the questions he asked myself, he asked me, uh, Daniel, uh, he, he said in his question, he said that we divide the unity of God. Uh, how do you understand, he said to me in part of his question, how do you understand if God is one, how can you say that Jesus is divine? That was part of a, a question that had several other questions. And so it becomes extremely important that we understand 
that the Christian church and orthodoxy never, ever, ever divide the oneness of God. And I was very adamant, and I said to him, never, ever, ever do we deny that God is one. We hold to the Hebrew revelation in Deuteronomy, the Shema, which was an important creedal statement, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. The problem is with the meaning of the word one. Because we hold to the fact that God is one. And and I think it's important we recognize that the oneness of God is more than the single digit number one. We hold to the fact that he is one, and there's not two, and there are not three, and there are not four gods. There is but one God that we worship and submit to. We say when he, when he, we say that he is one, we mean more than just number one. We also mean that he is unique. That he's not like any other God from any God, so-called gods in the entire world. Not only is he one in number, he is one in who he is. There's no one that compares with our God. There's no one that is like our God. There's no one anywhere in the entire created and uncreated order that can compete with who our God is, the Hebrew Christian God. He is one and there is no other. When he speaks, no one can contradict. When he promises, no one can revoke his promises. When he warns, no one can offer refuge. And this Shema was so important to the Hebrew people. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Especially when they lived, survived, were born, matured, and became a people in a, in a community of polytheistic groups of people all around them, whether in Egypt, whether they went to the land of Cana, whether they ended up in Babylon. This statement of faith was the statement of faith of the Hebrew people. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one and there is no other beside him. And we Christians hold to that same faith. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. We have but one God. The concept of the Trinity does not do away at all with the oneness of God. But I'm going to develop this as I move ahead and as I deal with Jesus Christ next week. I'm going to start teaching you how the Nicene Creed, how the, the Trinity and the concept of the Trinity begins. But we make a clear statement at the beginning of our creed that we believe in one God. We don't have two gods, three gods, or any other God than the one unique God. Let's just begin here. We believe in one God. The second or the third thing we say and, and proclaim is that he is the Father. We believe in one God, the Father. Uh, within the Godhead, within who God is, there is, in our belief, there is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. When we say that we believe in one God who is the Father, we are affirming two things. We are affirming that God is the or in God there is the Father who is the Father of Jesus Christ, the Father of the Son. So when we believe, when we proclaim that we believe in one God who is the Father, we are clearly with Jesus who called God Father all through the Gospels. All through the Gospels. Jesus speaks to God not as a Father 
or I am a son, but he clearly believes and states that the relationship he had with the Father is that the Father is there, the Son is there, and the Spirit is there. And so when we say that God is the Father, we are saying that he's the Father of the Son, the Father of Jesus Christ. But we're saying more than that. We're also saying that he's our Father. We're saying that he's our father by adoption because of what Jesus has done. Because the word became flesh, we have been given the right to be sons and daughters of God. Because of Jesus Christ, we have access to that father, to his father, through Jesus, the son. So when we say we believe in one God, the Father, we're talking about the Father of Jesus, but also we're talking about our Father. In fact, Jesus, when he taught us to pray, he said, pray this way, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He taught us to talk to the Father as our Father and not some distant God some inaccessible God, but to speak to him, Abba, Father, my dear daddy, my dad in heaven. To speak to him with the same intimacy that he himself has with his father. So we say, we believe in one God, the Father. The next statement we make is that he's almighty. He's almighty. In other words, the God that we believe is all-powerful. There's no one that can compete with him. There's no one that can uh, be more powerful than him. He is almighty. And one of the things that is so important, we can recite this and not recognize that we are indeed saying we believe in the God not only that has the power, the amazing power to create all things, But I want you to understand that when we pray, we are praying to Almighty God, who is my Father. When you pray with the understanding that you are praying to your Father in heaven, who has the capacity, who has the power, and who has love for you, you can pray with certainty that the God you're praying to can answer every single one of your prayers. And you should never pray with doubt because your Father is almighty, almighty, and able to do any and everything He chooses to do. He will hear our prayers and He will act in accordance to His will. But His hand is never short. His will is never against you. He wants to bless you. So when you pray, always have the certainty that you're praying to the God who is almighty, all-powerful, omnipotent, and omniscient. We believe in that God and that Father who is almighty. And not only to answer our prayers, He's the Father that created all things Every single thing that has ever been created, which is the next statement, he's the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, comma. I don't want you to ignore that comma. We tend to say the creed and ignore that comma. It says that he is the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, Visible and invisible. Nothing that has ever been created, nothing that has ever been created in heaven or on earth, in the visible realm or the invisible realm, was ever created without the God of the universe calling it into existence. The almightiness of God is visible primarily in the act of creation. He called it out of nothing. There is a theological word which is called ex nihilo, which means out of nothing. He's the only God that creates out of nothing. 
something that never existed. He just calls it into being. And by the power of his word, it becomes. And chaos becomes order. And he called light out of nothing, and it became light. And the earth was all in darkness. And he said, let there be light. And light shone in the darkness, and the darkness retreated. And he called every aspect of creation out of the almightiness, powerful, omnipresent, and omnipotent power of God. He created and it became. And he breathed his life into that man and woman and he created humanity. Nothing that has ever been created, whether angels archangels or the hosts of heaven or anything in the invisible realm was created without God. That's the God we believe in. We believe we together as one body in unity with one another, unity of the faith, unity of conviction, we believe together in one God, the Father, my Father, your Father, the Father of Jesus, the Almighty that showed his power in the creation of all things. And all things, because he created them, belong to him. And all things have been because the Father of God created them. The creator of heaven and earth. Of all that has ever been created. The visible and the invisible realm. All things were created by our God. That's the God that we affirm. That's the God that we defend. That's the God that we expect to see at the end of life. That is the God who has made us promises. And that's the God we should be willing to do anything for because he is our God. And when we say the creed, this is what we believe. Credo. Next week, I'm going to start dealing with Jesus Christ and with his being. But this is the first portion of the creed. And I want to make sure that you know, whenever you say the creed, what is it that you are saying. Amen? Amen. May I invite you to come and stand with me, please?